We come this morning, as I'm sure you all know, to the second in our series, Foundation Truths of Biblical Christianity, to the topic of the authority of Scripture. For what we have in the Bible is the written form of what God has said, what God has spoken. The great theme that penetrates from beginning to end of the Bible is that God has spoken. In Genesis chapter 1 at creation, we read the words, God said, let there be light and there was light. The word of God right at the beginning, effective and powerful. And within that same chapter, Genesis chapter 1, we read of God speaking to mankind. In Adam, the crown of his created order, man made as the image of God. For God created the universe as the setting in which he could talk with and speak to men and women. And we could go through every page of the Bible from beginning to end and see that God has spoken. And even at the end of the New Testament in the book of Revelation, we read the words, this is what the Spirit says to the churches. And as we read the Bible, we read something of what God is like, something of His salvation and ways and His thoughts, the way in which He has revealed Himself. And we know largely that he has spoken through his servants, the prophets, and through his apostles in the New Testament. Because at the fall, the immediate and intimate knowledge of God that our first parents enjoyed was broken because of the fall. And as we read on into the New Testament, we find the greatest revelation of God's Word was the Word Himself. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. And when He spoke, He didn't say what the prophet said, thus says the Lord. He said, but I say to you. So we need to understand first and foremost this morning that what we have within Holy Scripture is God's Word in written form. God's Word in Scripture. But our particular angle on God's Word this morning isn't its power that we can see in created order, isn't its effectiveness as we have experienced God calling us from death to life or God's truthfulness, or whether it's consistent. But that God's Word is authoritative. The authority of Holy Scripture. Now what do we mean by that word authority? It's not simply that the Bible is like an expert in a certain sphere, an expert in matters of religion. And like people who have expertise, they can be fallible sometimes. The Bible's authority isn't that. It has authority. Because God himself is speaking. It has authority because from the Bible, God is addressing us as individuals personally. Our basic Christian confession, the thing that we love to hear from the lips of men and women is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the absolute sovereign. Jesus is my sovereign. He is the one who rules my life. And just as we would never dare tamper with or ignore or dismiss, the decree of an earthly sovereign, the authorities in any land, we dare not do so with the Word of God where the absolute sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is addressing us. 
Jesus is our sovereign Lord and he addresses us from his word. And as his word is read, it speaks to us and judges us. We don't judge it and question it. Or do we? Isn't that precisely the problem with humanity? Isn't that precisely the problem that we experience time and again? Isn't that exactly what we see going on in the church at the end of the 20th century? With the Word of God, the Bible? And haven't men and women in our own time fallen again into the trap that our first parents fell into? God gave them His Word. And the evil one came along and directed his attack, as you remember from Genesis chapter 3, to the integrity and the truthfulness and the goodness of God. Do you remember how he came to the woman and God's word was represented to her as an arbitrary, pointless limiting of her freedom? And as she began to listen to that, doubt regarding the justice of what he said crept in and doubt gave way to unbelief. And then the transgression that God was wanting to prevent men and women from participating in appeared to her and them to be the way of freedom. And what we find is that desire ultimately dismissed the word of God and sin came into the world. But do you see how it comes in when God's word is represented as arbitrary and pointless and doubt gives way to unbelief? But that's what we find in the church even in our own time. Where the word that God has spoken is questioned and distrusted, rejected and disregarded, And we try to live in our own way without the Word of God. And yet you see what James says in our own passage. What we find in what God has given, it's the perfect law that gives freedom. What we find in the Bible is perfect because it reveals God's nature as God Himself reveals it. There isn't any guesswork. God has spoken to us about himself. It's perfect because it matches our need as a humanity. But it gives freedom to... Do you remember how at the beginning, when God was giving men and women at the time of Sinai the Ten Commandments? Do you remember the way in which God began speaking them? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. And he gave them at that point his law, not as the means of salvation, but as the lifestyle of those who have already been redeemed and have come out of slavery and are going to live in freedom. What we have, you see, in the Bible is the perfect law that gives freedom and as James says in verse 25 he will be blessed who obeys it and I want us this morning to look at this passage that James gives to us which is full of practical wisdom of how we in our own generation can live under the authority of Holy Scripture under the authoritative word of God. Now James knows that there are struggles in the Christian life. In verses 13 to 15 of chapter 1, he has already said that we need to overcome the old nature. And in verse 18, he's already said that we have a new nature. And in the struggle that we have between the old nature and the new nature, that is an ongoing struggle as long as we live. Even though it's hard, it's never fruitless. 
Verse 17 reads, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And every good and perfect gift is our portion as we seek to live. But what James is wanting to do in particular in this passage, for those who have the Word of God, is to say how we can move from spiritual infancy into spiritual maturity. And the key to fruitfulness and the key to progress is simply the Word of God. Verse 18, He chose to give us birth through the Word of Truth. Verse 21, Humbly accept the word planted in you that produces salvation. The salvation that is the righteous life here and now that God desires to see. And you see what he says. Just in three words in the passage that we read. How we can demonstrate personally in the way we live that we actually do live under the authority of the Word of God. Verse 19, listen. Verse 21, accept. Verse 22, do. Or we might say, verse 19, be attentive to the Word of God. Verse 21, be receptive of the Word of God. And verse 22, be obedient to the Word of God. And I want us to take each one of these in turn and just very briefly see what James is teaching here. In verse 19, be attentive to the Word of God. Listen. Everyone, he says, should be quick to listen. Now, there's nothing worse in teaching than teaching or talking to someone and knowing or realizing at the end of your lesson that they haven't been paying a blind bit of attention to what you've been teaching. I remember once in the staff room at lunchtime there was one teacher who talked non-stop to the person sitting next to her. And when the bell rang for afternoon school she said, I've been doing an awful lot of talking, I hope I haven't been boring you. And the reply came back, no, I haven't been listening. <laughs> now that's a real put down, but isn't that the way in which so many people listen to the Word of God? God comes to us and time and again speaks to us. And He says, have you been listening? And we say, no, I haven't been paying a blind bit of attention. And James indicates to us, first and foremost in this passage, the kind of listening that is acceptable, the kind of listening that demonstrates that we have accepted the authority of the Word of God. First, he says it positively, the kind of listener who accepts the Word of God as authoritative is the one who is quick to listen. Put that negatively, he says he's the kind of person who's slow to speak, slow to anger. Now we live in a society which is democratic and we thank God for that. And we're accustomed to expressing our view and our point of view and we bless God for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. But isn't that kind of thing entirely out of place when we're hearing God's word, when the sovereign is speaking to us? The King of kings and the Lord of lords is addressing us from His Word and we listen and we study and we apply ourselves to understand it. You see the way in which in verse 25 James expands what it means to be attentive and listen to God's Word. We're the kind of people who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and not only so, we continue to do that. Do you remember how on the day of resurrection Mary ran to the tomb first thing in the morning? 
and she sees in the darkness the stone rolled away. She sees at a distance. And she thought they'd taken the body. She jumps to the wrong conclusion entirely. And then if you remember, John came and stood at the entrance to the tomb and saw in the gloom the grave clothes there and he thought, well, the body is still there. No one's taken it. And it was left to the Apostle Peter who stooped down and went in and allowed his eyes to grow accustomed to the darkness and waited and applied himself to see that they believed. He went out of his way to look into this matter. It was at some inconvenience to himself that he took the time and the trouble and the effort. Says James, we need to be quick to listen and take the time and the effort to listen to God's word. But that's not at the beginning of Christian experience only. It's something that we do continually. But you might ask, why do we need to apply ourselves to God's Word continually? When we were converted, right at the beginning of our Christian experience, we found that the gospel that was preached that we heard matched what God was doing within our own hearts and lives. The gospel that was preached, the word that we read, matched the new nature that God was secretly and quietly implanting within our hearts. And having heard the word of God, having understood the word of God as it was proclaimed to us, we made our response. But you see, that's typical of the way in which God works. And that pattern continues throughout our Christian experience. Where the word that was implanted is watered by the word that is read and heard. And we go on hearing and go on listening to that word, and that word that God has implanted grows. One commentator on this passage writes these words, By hearing the life-giving word, the energies of the new nature already implanted are stimulated into action. So do you see why we need to listen? Why right at the beginning instead of giving ourselves to speaking and giving our own opinion, or becoming quick to anger, we give ourselves to listen. Says James, be attentive. Listen to the Sovereign. Listen to the King of Kings as He's addressing you from His Word. But then in the second place, in verse 21, He says, be receptive. Accept Humbly accept the word planted in you. We have the sovereign speaking. And we listen. And we accept it because it's the sovereign who's spoken to us. But do you see what this verse is about in the way in which we receive God's word? The way in which we receive God's word is by preparing ourselves to hear it. By the attitude we adopt towards it as it comes to us from God. And then what results from receiving it. We prepare ourselves by getting rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. By beginning to deal with the evil nature that is still within us. That fallen nature that God is dealing with. And then humbly accepting the word planted in us. And what's the result? It's that that saves us. It's the evidence of accepting that in the present that we're born again. So all the present indications of a change in our life 
It's that righteous life that God desires as we accept that word. Jesus gave many illustrations and many parables of receiving the word of God and this one here is so similar to the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. Do you remember that parable, how the sower goes out and there are four kinds of soils that the seed falls upon, falls onto the path and lies on its surface and the birds come and take it away and it falls among the rocks and grows up very quickly and then in the heat of the day it shrivels up sown among the thorns and the thorns choke its growth but other seed falls onto the good soil and the question that James places before us is this when the word of God comes to you how do you accept it? what kind of heart is yours that receives the word of God? And of course, we all say of ourselves, my heart is so full of weeds that I know that unless God does something, unless God enables me, it's simply going to be choked, which is why James tells us right at the beginning of this verse, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent we know that we still have that old nature and the natural man doesn't accept the word of God but gladly accepts that moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent in the evil in the old nature. Says James, humbly accept the word planted in you. We need to deal with our old nature but humbly accept the word that has been planted within us. You see, it's already there. God has already given it to us. He has implanted it within our souls according to his grace and his love. And what James is saying there is cultivate it, nurture it because the implanted word of God has its own life and vitality. But growth takes place as we have already seen, as we receive increasingly fully the word that makes us his sons and daughters. But you say to yourself, how can I keep these weeds down? How can I deal with that part of my life that I am so ashamed of, that I know needs to be dealt with? I was speaking to someone in, this own, in our own congregation about gardening. And he said the way in which he keeps the weeds down, and I don't know why it's, I didn't think of it myself, the way in which he keeps the weeds down is actually by planting all that he wants to be there. Isn't that obvious? And yet isn't that what we don't do? We want to see the fruits of righteousness within our own lives. That righteous life that God desires. And therefore, we need to cultivate it. We need to make sure that we give time and effort in producing those kinds of fruits for God and in this way keeping down and keeping at bay the old nature. But in the third place the apostle says be obedient. Verse 22 begins with a great warning. A warning that is sounded to every believer. Don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. It's something we need to heed and take and recognize the importance of what James is saying here. Because we so easily deceive ourselves in saying, yes, I read the Bible. Yes, I listened to a sermon. 
and that's all that we've done. And we actually go away and give the life to the, be, to the belief that God's word is authoritative in our life. Says James, be obedient, do what it says, the sovereign has spoken. And we therefore must do what he says, obey what he says. For when scripture addresses us, it's God who's speaking. And we believe and trust and live our lives in the light of God's word. In verses 23 and 24, the Apostle James gives us an illustration of obedience. What it means to obey and not simply to listen but do. And he speaks about a man who takes a mirror and looks at himself within it and goes away and forgets what he looks like. And he says it's like that when we take a look at the Word of God and see ourselves in it, see what it's teaching us. But it's what happens next that is the point of the illustration, isn't it? It's not simply taking the Word of God and looking at it. We need to ask ourselves the question, has it done anything? Has it changed us in any way? Do we take scripture only to go away and forget what it's been teaching us about our Christian life and our lifestyle, about God and his salvation? Do we take scripture and remember what it says and do it? You see, we take things in and we remember things that are important and we forget things that are trivial or things that for us are insignificant and have no importance to us. And if we take the word of God and listen to it and go away and forget it, what we're actually saying about the word of the sovereign is that whatever he says is a matter of insignificance to me. There's little point, says James, in taking your Bible and reading if if it changes nothing. If we question its teaching, if we disregard it, if we dismiss it. But when we take God's word, we need to ask ourselves, how must I change in the light of what God is saying here? How may I redirect my life to live in the way that God is saying? How must I change my mind and my thinking and my thoughts from what God is speaking to me about in this passage? How must I deal with myself and restrain what God hates and cultivate what God loves in the passage that he's speaking to me out of? How must I discipline myself? How must I form new outlooks on life? How must I see things differently? How must I change from the word of the sovereign? How much new have I learned of God and his love for me? How much have I increased in my understanding of the cross and all that it means? See, getting to grips with God's word is like learning the very first principles of any discipline and then progressing in increased knowledge of it so that we can have a more accurate understanding of that subject. But why do we want to understand it? So that we can make practical use of what we learn. like going overseas and learning a new language and learning a new culture. We do so with a view of practical use in daily tasks in that new land. It's like learning a whole new way of thinking. Not simply so that we can have knowledge and it mean nothing to us but so that we can make practical and daily use 
of what we learn. Says James in verse 18, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that word that has been planted within us, that seed that in the grace of God has its own vitality and is watered as we continue to look intently into the word of God. But what do we know of seed? We look for the growth. We plant in order that we can reap a harvest. We plant in order that we can see the beauty of nature. And that word that has been implanted by the sovereign grows as we go on listening and obeying. Do you see the two choices that we've got? The two ways that James lays before us? Verse 22, we can deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves when we listen and don't obey. Or we can go the way of blessing in verse 25. He will be blessed in what he does. And the way of blessing is listening, humbly accepting the word of God and being obedient. We've been thinking this morning about the authority of Holy Scripture. We began by seeing that God has spoken His Word. We need to be attentive. We need to accept and to receive that Word. But we need to go on further and be obedient to the Sovereign in the Word that He's given to us. Amen. Now as we close our service this morning, we'll be singing hymn number 289. And we've been thinking of the Word of God as the Word that comes from the Sovereign. And I want us to sing this hymn reaffirming that we live accepting the authority of the Sovereign. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight returned victorious. Every knee to him shall bow, crown him. Crowns become the victor's brow. Hymn number 289.